Well, good morning, folks. Um, okay. Good morning for those who are tuning or yet to t be tuning. Um, let me start by apologizing for the 26 minutes delay. Um, forgive us. And now, as promised, we are um, broadcasting this seminar. Ideally, it would have been after the ladies' breakfast, which is our tradition here uh, once a year before Mother's Day. Mothering Sunday is tomorrow, and we just want to say thank you to our mothers or the ladies in our lives for all that they do for us um, every year. May the Lord bless you. We cannot thank you enough, but um, we don't just want, to, want you to come and eat, and now you cannot come and eat anyway, but we feel that it's so important to broadcast this seminar. Those of you who are part of this church family, you know the focus of uh, my, my vision um, to bring medical seminars to you. Last year or so, we brought you a um, seminar on prostate cancer. We brought in uh, Diabetes UK and, um, and so on and so forth. Today, as promised, we want to help you to understand um, more about breast cancer and menopause. The first segment of our seminar is going to be on menopause. I'll be introducing our seminar speakers in a moment. First, the chairman and then um, the one that will follow after him. But may the Lord bless you for taking the time. Some of you are joining in now, and I want to welcome you. What you can do to help yourself and to help others is to share the link uh, with your friends and family, those of you who are on various um, social media platforms. Why don't you copy the link and share it with them? Um, it will be a great help to your friends and family around the world. It is said that it is better to put uh, a fence at the top of the hill than to put an ambulance at the bottom of the hill. So in other words, prevention is better than cure. So you do someone a great service by sharing this information with your friends and family. We live in a challenging time as we are all experiencing uh, um, this coronavirus situation. And so this is one of the ways that you can help yourself health-wise uh, uh, to maintain your health, to know more about menopause, and to know more about breast cancer, and to invite your friends and family to tune in. Um, we are making room for questions and answers. The experts are here, and we're going to, after they've spoken, we want you to send in your, your um, questions by Facebook, um, I think we're going to be on Facebook later on, um, but at least on YouTube, you can send in your questions. If you are familiar with our church mobile phone number or the landline uh, um, um, number, um, you can also connect with us by sending in your questions so that um, though our seminar speakers will do their very best to answer them for you. Um, do engage with us because we want you to get the most out of this seminars. Okay? Um, the church mobile phone number, in case you haven't got it, is 07724 Okay? Let me give that again slowly. 0774 and you can send in your questions so that we can put them to the seminar uh, um, speakers so that they will be able to answer them for you. So share this with your friends and family and stay tuned in. First topic, uh, many posts. And, I'm, and I, as, I, as previously done, I brought in a um, Nightingale Nurses Association. They know what they are doing. And I want to say a big thank you to them um, I want to um, introduce the uh, chairman, um, Mr. Albert Echamfo, to take over from me. After he's uh, done his part, I will come back and see where we take it from. God bless you, 
And may the Lord be with you. Would you come, Mr. Albert? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pastor. May God bless you. Um, I'm quite privileged to be here today um, to talk to you through what menopause is about. As Pastor said, um, my name is Albert Echampo. I'm the chairman for Nightingale Nurses Association. And we've got a few of our associations, a fellow with us today. And they are all here to support the program. Uh, Pastor Sir Cornelius, thank you very much um, for this seminar. Because of the COVID-19, um, we haven't got the audience here and with us, but I do understand that the audience are following us on live, so Facebook, and also the um, YouTube channel for this great organization, Ellen Pentecosta, which Pastor Cornelius um, preside as the senior pastor in Croydon, London. Thank you. So I would like to start by us looking at a few things. Um, firstly, if you look at the screen there, we've got a very lovely baby, but it's very difficult to determine the sex of this baby just by looking at the picture. I'm not sure if anyone can guess, but looking at a baby like this is very difficult to determine the sex as to if the baby is a male or a female. It's quite so difficult. As we are born, hormones determine our physical appearances. And hormones help to build our physical appearances as well. Either you are a male or a female. This is a picture of a mango tree. When a mango tree is like this, it doesn't really appeal much for eating. But once you have it like this, then it becomes more appealing for you to have some uh, to eat. So the human journey is also uh, like this. When kids are quite young or babies, they don't attract each other in an opposite way. But as we're growing and growing and growing, we get the attraction for each other. And hormones help to build our physical attractions. Hormones help to build our physical um, so it's a nature to which we get attracted to each other. I will take this test from the Bible. Genesis 2, 22, it says, if you read the American, the New American Standard Version, and the Lord, God fashioned into a woman a rib, which he had taken from a man and brought to the man. The word fashioned, a lot of people believe, is like a design. So a woman is designed in such a way that a woman will be attractive to a man. And the man is also designed in such a way that a man will be attracted to a woman. So the idea of the hormones determine who a man is and determine who a woman is, is for procreation, where women will be attracted to, women, uh, to men, and men will be attracted to women, and then you can have children. So a woman develops through these stages and have their shape and their physical beings. When women are going through the phases, they, they, they develop during the adolescent, and you start having their breast developing. There is a lot of changes in their body, their height, their shape. They start growing hairs in the pubic areas, and they start their menstrual cycle. 
And the hormone responsible for that is called estrogen. So estrogen normally helps in that hormone a pattern in say, women. So the shape of a woman will broaden up. The estrogen will help the pelvic bones to be much broader. The estrogen will help a lot of muscles to be formed around the backside of the woman. The estrogen will help the breast to come in such a manner and the muscles around the arm, the armpit, and the abdominal area will be formed in such a manner to support the breast. The estrogen will help these hormones to be formed in such a manner that when the woman carries a baby, the muscles is in a good position to help the woman carry the baby throughout the nine months a journey. So you can see the male side, the features and development, and the female side. It is obvious from this picture that the female pelvic area is formed in a much rounder circular form. The female breast area is formed in a specific shape pattern compared to the male side on the other side. So you can see that the estrogen helping the formation of a woman so that the woman will be designed in such a manner that it will be much easier for the body to take on the pressure of pregnancy. It's quite different from the way the males develop. So as I said earlier, when you have the estrogen helping the woman to form their pelvic bones, the pelvic bone goes much broader, much circular, which helps the woman during pregnancy and then during a delivery. So you can see the picture here that the design of the body and the design of the pelvic bone is somehow different from the way the males develop their pelvic bone. And it's also different from the way the male have their body developed. So I'm going to do a comparative one with the male. So you can see clearly from this picture that the pelvic bone of the man is not broader, it's not wider, it's quite small compared to the pelvic bone of a woman that we saw here, which is much broader, wider, and all this is being shaped by the hormone that will determine whether you are a female or a male. And on this case, or in this instance, is the female hormone. Then you ask yourself, what will happen if a man gets pregnant with the shape that they have? Men, normally, our development is not shaped in such a manner that we can hold pregnancy. So most women have this natural development shape, and they also have their development of the bones and the muscle designed in such a manner that they can hold pregnancy. So we have talked about how men and women develop, and we have attributed the development of good pelvic bones good muscles that will prepare a woman for pregnancy and delivery, and we have attributed that to a hormone called estrogen. Now, women normally from adolescent A stage go through a menstrual cycle. And the menstrual cycle is a cycle where their ovaries get developed and ready to have 
sperms that will fertilize to form babies. So every month they go through that, and the hormones that is responsible for that is estrogen. One, it controls the fluid and electrolytes of the body, and it moisturizes the skin of a woman. Two, it prepares the follicles for the release of an egg. That is the egg in the woman, and also controls the changes in the woman's cervical mucus. If we want to talk a bit more about the physiology of the menstrual cycle, we will say the estrogen also prepares the internal environment for fertility and uh, sperm, and it makes sperm very self friendly by attracting it to the ovaries. Now, every month, this is what happens. The ovaries get developed, waiting to meet a sperm. And if it does not meet any sperms, it breaks down and it comes as menses. So women need estrogen quite a lot. And the estrogen always help in the developmental stages of a woman. So as you can see, estrogen normally helps to prepare the woman for fertility. Now, let me go straight to this point. We have menopause being the actual problems that a lot of women suffers when they are aging. Geographically, you have a lot of say, women, the egg in them get depleted when they get into 40 years old down. Now, when the estrogen in your youthful age is helping you to go through that menstrual cycle, it always maintains the production of the egg in a woman. When you are just about 40 years and on, the estrogen level comes down, and the ovaries that helps to prepare every month also comes down. So it will get to a time that your normal pattern of having your menses will also decrease as your ovaries are decreasing. We can see it from this slide that there are stages in fertility. One, we call the first stage after you've had your first menses as the productive stage where you've been having your menses quite regularly, which is being contributed by one, by estrogen being produced so regularly to promote the activities of your semences. And two, the menopausal transition or the perimenopausal stage, which is when you are not getting your regular semences, but sometimes, maybe two or three months, you do it once or twice. And third is the menopausal stage, just about 51 years, when you are not receiving enough of the estrogen which produces the cycle or which helps to maintain the cycle. And also when the eggs are depleting slightly low. So, we look at several things that predisposes people to early menopausal syndromes. One, it could be a genetic factor, and also we know that people with um, Saturnus syndrome have less say, menopausal, um, well, they have early menopausal problems, and sometimes there is some mutation of genes 
And uh, we have something called the Bloom's syndrome, which also characterizes that. We also have people going through a lot of factors, such as exposing themselves to cell radiation, which makes them start their cell menopause a bit early. And also there are some cell genetic factors as well, um, which helps in pre-cell mutation. Uh, we know that in some areas of the world, they have early cell menopause than some other areas in the world, all in the graph above. There are signs that comes with menopause. One, we have hot flashes. So most people experiencing cell menopause will firstly experience premenopausal cell syndromes. And the premenopausal cell syndromes roughly will be occurring from 40 years and above. So if you are someone that has been receiving your menses all the time, and then it gets to a stage in life when you're not having enough estrogen being produced by your body, when the eggs in your body is quite depleting a bit, you see that you'll not be having it as regular as every month. Sometimes two or three a monthly, then something a little will come out. So when you get to that stage, then you should know that you are getting into semenopausal stage. It may also be not that you are getting straightly into the menopausal stage, but sometimes there might be other environmental or social or personal factors that will be causing your menses not to flow very regularly as it used to do when you are much younger. So hot flashes is one of the signs and the symptoms. And because you'll be having hot flashes, you tend to sweat a lot. Especially when you're sleeping at night, it will become hot, then you start sweating. And when you start sweating at night and you don't have enough sleep, you wake up with fatigue. And when you are stressed during the day, with much fatigue, what normally happens is that you might lose your libido sometimes. And because you're not having enough estrogen produced, which helps with the lining of your uterus by ensuring that all the time the vaginal area is being wet when it gets to this stage, you'll be having increased vaginal dry or say dryness. It will affect your mood because it may well be that at that time of the age, you are a career say woman, you're doing so very well, and uh, you started experiencing the symptoms that you are not familiar with. You can be a little bit upset about that, and it will affect your mood as well. So when that happens, people with less sleep due to the hotness, mood destability, can have other symptoms like dizziness, which comes over there. And also, people do gain weight through the process, and uh, some people also get a little bit of incontinence. You always lose concentration, and uh, it's quite a stressful time for a lot of people who go through these stages. Then your nails become a little bit brittle, and it breaks off. And sometimes, because you sweat quite regularly, you start developing odor from your armpits. And then people also have irregular heartbeat associated with menopause, And then your breast 
and your joint become very painful because the oestrogen used to help the muscles to hold on the pressure from your breast and then help the muscles in the joint. But once it's declining, you tend to have a lot of issues with the muscles around your breast, which can be so painful, and also your joints. Then you have people having digestive problems. Some have a bloated tummy. And some really go into depression as a result of that, which is quite unfortunate. People have something that we call menstrual migraine. That comes with it. And um, there are few things that comes with this menopausal syndromes as well, which can be a bone loss and then heart problems. Now, the long term, people could progress to suffer some kind of dementia, but this will be as a result of overall cognitive function of the person. And some people can have osteoarthritis as a result of that. There are a few questions that people may ask that should I see a doctor or a nurse if I'm going through this menopausal sy syndrome? The answer to that is, if you are 45 years old, you do not need to see a doctor or a nurse if you understand and you are sure that you are going through menopausal syndrome. However, if your symptoms are severe, then you should really ask for a help. So several answers has been given to that question, and I believe Pastor will pass it on. Or when you go to the menopause website, you can get it. Someone may ask, is there a test for menopause? Yes, there is a test for the menopause. But usually, that test only is given out to people going through the menopausal syndrome who are much, much more younger. So if you have someone like 20 years old going through the menopausal syndrome, maybe the doctors will decide to let a person go through the test so that we will have a clear mind as to if the person is really going through the menopausal syndrome or the person is having other illnesses. Can I still get pregnant when I'm going through the menopause? As long as you are still having some kind of interrupted menstrual cycles, yes, you can still get pregnant. So you have to be careful when you are going through some interrupted cementra cycle. But if you're not having your menstrual cycles at all, then obviously you're not going to get pregnant. So it's quite tricky, and you always need to be careful. Treatments. So we can use hormones, because we know that the underlying um, defect in the declining of the production of estrogen as a hormone is the main reason why you go through that set symptoms. So we have hormones which are basically um, estrogen um, based that you can have. One of those is ospimifin. Um, you can have which helps to um, relieve the vaginal dryness and then ospimifin is not e estrogen though. I mean, you can have estrogen hormones and one of the medication is ospimifin um, that helps with the dryness of the vagina area. Then 
if you go into depression, yes, you can have some antidepressive, some medications, or we can work you through some exercises and breathing techniques to help you with that symptoms. Um, there are some medications which are anti seizure air medication, which helps with the hotness and the hot flashes that people have been having all the time. And then one of the questions is, what can I do to protect my bones? So we said that estrogens helps in bone formation, and that is what helps also for people say, to say develop. So when it's going down, sometimes um, we all say, suffer a bit. And then um, you can take vitamin D as a supplement, uh, but you have to be careful with the dose and always go through your general a practitioner to give you the right dose, which is your say, GP. You can take in either an active or a passive exercise depending on how fit you are. And then um, if you need a doctor to prescribe or a specialized nurse to prescribe, you can always uh, contact them. Or two. There are some herbal some medicines that can also help um, people go for um, prime rose oil or St. Joss Watt. And uh, uh, there are some alternative some medicine which are some therapies such as um, acupuncture, home homeotherapy that helps with the pains that people experience during menopause. Okay. So we have one question online. Mm -hmm. The question is, what kind of natural foods and medication can we take to assist us? Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, what is the name of the person asking the question, please? Patricia. Hello, Patricia. Th thank you very much. Can I quickly finish with this, and then we'll go to the questions. So, Patricia, I'll come back to you as a question. But these are some of the food that you can take. Um, you can take food like soya beans, chicken peas, beans and peas, uh, which is quite common and cheap, that can really, really help with the menopause. Um, you can also, yes, so uh, beans ch ch and chickpeas, beans and peas are very, very good. They are quite cheap and they are also good. Um, with some menopause. And also, as I said earlier, vitamin D as a supplement is quite good. So you can have vitamin D as a supplement as well. So all that we do is what we've summarized here. What do you do in practice to make sure that you hold off some of these symptoms? Like the hot flashes and the nice sweat, what you basically do is that you put up your clothing in layers. So example, if it's winter and you are going out, you should put a clothing in say, say layers. When you are leaving home and you're feeling cold, because you know that it's likely you're gonna get hot when you get out, you put up your clothing in say layers. So when you go out and it get a little bit hot, then you take the first one off, you still got a layer, a benefit. So you can put three layers of clothing on and then Depending on how you feel, whether you feel hot or cold, you put it back on or you take it off. And two, you can make sure that the environment that you live in, the thermostat is always low. And you should avoid drinking hot drinks, such as a coffee and tea, when you're going through that menopausal cell syndromes. We know that people put cold and what clothing um, when they are going through the hot cell flashes. So you can put maybe a towel in some water. Then when you're having the hot cell flashes, you can either put it on your forehead or maybe a part of your body that will help with you to cool down. And then um, if you are someone that is going through some menopause, you have to try and limit the smoking. Um, you can either quit say, smoking if you do, which, because it does make the hot flashes 
very, very um, worse, or it does make it very difficult to self control. Then the vaginal dryness, uh, we will say you should always use some kind of lubrication before you engage in any um, love affairs, I should put it said that way. Um, you can use a lot of vagina moisturizers um, to lubricate your vagina anytime that it gets dry. And with a sleeping problem, um, what you can do is to try as much as possible to go to sleep at a particular time of the night, and then you wake up at a particular time because it does help to regulate your sleep very, very well. And also, um, you can avoid caffeine or drinking too much alcohol because caffeine is a stimulant. And if you're having problems with sleeping and you drink a lot of secafe, you make your sleeping pattern very uh, challenging. So try as much as possible to avoid caffeine in mid-afternoon. Uh, if you want to take secafe to boost your energies a level up, it should be first thing in the morning. But when you take it mid-afternoon, you're going to have some challenging sleeping at the right time in the evening. Then if you feel depressed, all you should do is to try and stay a little bit active, um, consult your doctor in a timely way, and speak to people. It can be a specialized nurse who specializes in say, menopause or other say, illnesses, or you can go to your GP and speak to your GP. All that we would like to say to the men is that the physical things we see about the women which get us attracted is from hormones that is purely estrogen. It gets to a time in life when the hormones goes down. And when the hormones go down, it means that all those things that we see in the women will slowly come down. And that is the time they need our access support. So men should be also very supportive to the women when it gets to this stage. And we should be supportive throughout. Thank you very much, viewers. We thank you. So I will take the questions and that maybe I'll call a pastor to come in. Okay. Uh, one question that we have here is, what kind of natural food and medication can we take to assist us? Okay. That one was from Patricia. So the natural food, we have mentioned few, and we said peas. Peas are quite good. And the medications, we've talked about um, evening primrose. Uh, we've talked about St. John's Watt. We've talked about um, some few lubricants. And uh, if you go to your GPs, your GPs will look at your, your symptoms specifically and will prescribe the ideal say, medication for you. And I think if anyone has something more to say, uh, Sister Ivy can join me to say what she needs to say um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, another question that we have. I get very bad headaches when menstruating. Um, how can you, what, what can you help? Okay. I, how old is she? Um, I can ask. Um, would you mind telling us your age? Mm. Say again. Well, listen, I, I would assume she's over 40. Okay. So um, it may be or it may not be related to say, menopause. But I would advise that she should quickly see her GP about this and talk through her symptoms. It might be symptoms that is associate, associated with say, menstrual say, say cycles because some people have some same symptoms like cramps or some other related say, symptoms associated with when they are doing their period. So it's good she sees her GP to address that. So Sister Ivy is going to add a little bit more to the um, food that we need to take during some medication. Uh, good morning, everyone. For the foods as well, for the natural uh, herbs, herbal medication, I won't be recommending anything personally. But what I'll say is prefer I see your GP and then let them advise. For herbal medications, I won't personally advise or over the internet that you should go and buy this herbal or try this because I haven't tried it and I haven't got evidence to prove it. So I'm not going to recommend anything in the form of herbal. 
But during the menopausal period, because your estrogen levels is low, we recommend that you eat dairy products like milk, yogurt, cheese, with things that will give you vitamin D to increase your bone density. We want you to eat healthy fat like omega-3 that you get from fishes. We also want you to eat whole grains that will give you vitamin B, thiamine, niacin, that helps in the development of your bodies. We also encourage you to eat all fruits and vegetables. Every fruit and vegetable that you can lay on, whether, wherever you are in any part of the world, any fruit and vegetable that you can lay your hand on, it is important that you eat as much as you can. As already said, reduce your alcohol intake as much as you can. Alcohol and caffeine doesn't go away in postmenopausal and premenopausal and menopause. So please, as much as you can, you reduce the alcohol intake. You eat protein as well. Protein is very good for you. So as long as you eat food that contains your beans, your legumes, your meat, it's very important that you have them as well. In addition to that, you also need to, how do you call it, eat food that, foods like um, chicken peas, that's to say chickpeas, peanut, flax seeds, grapes, berries, palms, greens, and black tea. They are all part of the food that you need as a postmenopausal woman. And also, to make you very happy, in the one research I was reading, to help with your vagina dryness, you please need to continue to have sex. Don't ignore sex, because when you have sex, you have that natural lubrication. So to help you with the dryness, I encourage you to have sex during your menopausal, premenopausal period. And the more you have sex, it will reduce your vagina dryness. That's what I have to add. Thank you. I see that a number of you are watching and engaging with this seminar online. And thank you for the questions so far. Um, one question, how early can a woman start their menopause? Menopause, as he was saying, starts at the age of 50. But usually we are looking at anything from 40 and above. But it's individual because we have different genes, we come from different places, we come from different races, we brought up differently, our lifestyles are different. But anything between 40 upwards, you should expect, you begin to see those changes, it needs to alert you that you may be, and therefore you need to start keeping an eye on it. So if you are 40, get into, latest by 47, you start seeing those changes more frequent. So roughly by 51, you should be seeing that you are getting into your menopause. So from if you start getting below 40 and you're having those symptoms as mentioned by chairman, I'll be very worried. I, I was just going to say, can someone have menopause uh, in their mid to late 30s? Yes, it can, but that one is rare. rare. So if you begin to see it, then there's something that is not right. Officially, that is not, so you need to get that checked out as soon as possible. One of the symptoms you mentioned is uh, to, to do with depression. I beg your pardon to do with depression. Are we going to say that um, 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 menopause can be linked to mental illness? Yes, in a way, men men menopause can be linked to mental illness. Because if you get depressed, depression is one of the mental illnesses that we are trying to highlight people, especially we those in the African race who don't talk about, we don't want, we've stigmatized mental health illness to the point that anything, we don't want to talk about it. Depression can be linked to mental uh, health because you are going through hot flashes. You can't sleep. You are frustrated. You are tired. You mentally break down. That drives you into depression because all those things are working. You are trying to fight it. You are trying to control it. It's not working. You are turning left and right. So all this, you, your body begins to, you're mentally, you begin to shut down. And if you don't have somebody to talk to, you don't have your counseling, you don't seek support early, that is the time you lose it. And then, excuse me, to so say you drop into the box of depression. What can a, a husband do to support, especially if the woman has, um, has admitted? Sometimes men don't know what is going on, and the woman is not admitting that that is what they are going through, even in their 50s. Yeah? What can a man do? Okay, Pastor, thank you very much. I think um, that is why men should also be watching this education um, and as we said, from lack of said knowledge, we will also perish. So um, women naturally go through a phase, like men. And um, for some reason, menopause is one of the phases that so women go through that is quite challenging for them. And uh, all that men should do is to acknowledge that one, their spouses are going through that phase. And the phases comes with a lot of said challenges. 
personal set challenges. So the faith is also comes with a lot of things that the woman will not be there for you and your family. And at that time, that is where the partner should be very much accommodating and also be willing to help. For instance, um, we said menopause, go, it, it, it comes with low successual drive, which is drop of celibido. Menopause also come with um, cervaginal said dryness. So at that time, if you want to have some intimacy, you should know that this is what your partner is experiencing. So you should be very motivating. It's not every ethnic minority say woman that really likes buying things to put there or maybe trying other things. So you have to be accommodating and you have to know how to initiate your four plays, get the place ready before you penetrate and all those. So all those things are very, very important. And also we should also say no that Sometimes when you're sleeping together, they might be feeling very hot. And when they take the duvet, the duvet off, you shouldn't be like sh sh shouting, why have you taken the duvet off? Or, uh, or maybe turning the radiator off. Turning the, the radiator, yes. Turn the radiator on. Absolutely, absolutely. We have to go through the sentence with them. We have to make sure that we create the environment. We have to encourage them to see the GPs. We have to encourage them to take the medication. And uh, we have to be there for them through the processes. Yeah. Interestingly, um, Sir Ivy mentioned that um, during the symptoms being shown, that is when they need to be more intimate. That the difficulty is that this person is going through low, low libido and vagina dryness and all that. And so there, there seems to be two conflicting issues here. The person that is, is experiencing low libido needs to have more sex. And it's quite a, a, a what do you say about that? Okay, I think the intimacy is not necessarily se sexual intimacy. I beg your pardon. Yeah. yeah, there are other intimacies that you can show to your se partner. Okay. Something like say, touching, holding hugging. hands together, okay. hugging, doing things together, kissing. Okay. Yeah, so that, that is exactly what I think she was trying to say sure. by showing more what? intimacy. Massage. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can join. Yeah. You can join, yeah. Why don't you come, really? Because yes. there, there are certain um, things that we it might not so have we included. Okay. So, so, in supporting your partner, mm -hmm. we were throwing in things, and, and Millie is also. Yeah, so I've got sister, Sir Millie Centia, who is also a member of St. Nightingale. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. they are Sir women, they will be more Absolutely. suited to yeah. say more. What I want to add is at that time, uh, women go through a lot of processes. Address the audience. Yeah. Yes, yeah. as the okay. uh, chairman has explained. Some of the things has already been said. Going through hot flashes, sometimes some of the women becomes a bit tearful, you know, a quick angered and all that. So from what pastor asked, I would expect men you know, to know what the women are going through at that time. So some of the things you can do to help the women is encouraging them, you know, when, you know, they are down. First of all, to be aware of what is going on around them. Encourage them, support them, especially what um, Chairman explained. You have to prepare yourself, you know, bedtime, because you are already aware that the men, the women, that your wife is going through that kind of, you know, dryness, and, and uh, an, a moody time. So things like, you know, um, there are a lot of things out there at the shop. I, I mean, health uh, shop. Don't go to any other places. You can pop into pharmacy. We have specialists over there. Just speak to them. Don't be afraid, you know, uh, explaining what you are going through you at that time. The, prepar um, the preparation. You said there are a lot of prepar preparation. preparation. So what are the things that need to be put in place in preparation, especially in preparation, uh, yeah. bedtime preparation. Bedtime preparation, that's what I'm coming to. So when you go to pharmacy, explain to them what you're going through. Because some of us are, are, are shy. They, they feel shy to you know, explore what they are going through. They don't want friends to know. So as a husband, I mean, you should be knowing what your wife is going through. If the wife is not doing it, maybe she's not aware of what she has to, you know, uh, buy or get. So you, as a man, can also pop into pharmacy, 
I mean, they are ready to explore, tell you everything. They are specialists, some of them are doctors. So they will show you, if you go to pharmacy or uh, boots, it's also another place. They have loads of things you can use to, you know, lay them at the bedside, it's ready. Some of them, the men can use it and the women can also use it. So things at that time wouldn't be too difficult. In addition, what I want to ask, just like what Pastor is doing now, my recommendation is that men should also have this menopause as part of one of their sessions to under, so that like how you are doing it in your church, group sessions to educate the men as long as they know what is happening with their women. When their women get to that state, they will begin to under, because, because it's like they, they have no awareness of what menopause is. Yes, it's for women, but if you know what your wife is going through and you have been there with her in counseling, you have had sessions like what you are doing in church with the men, they understand the menopause. When I am I'm going through it, my husband will know what I'm going through and he will know what to do for me, how to handle me, where to take me, what to say. When I'm irritable, he will also go irritable. He knows I'm already irritable. He won't come at 7 p.m. when he knows he's supposed to be home at 5 p.m. Oh. Those kind of little, little things. Help. Understanding yes. Each other. Each other. So that is what I'll add today to help to, for the men. Thank okay, you. There's a question. Uh, we have a question from Sylvia. She asks, What if you are dairy intolerant? Can you recommend an alternative? Okay. Um, which is. Something to do with diet. Milk. Dairy. Mm -hmm. milk. Dairy. Oh, dairy. Okay. Yeah. Those as uh, dairy is not compulsory. If you are dairy intolerant, you don't use dairy. You can use any other option I've mentioned: the vegetables, the whole meals, the fibers, the fruits and vegetables. So if you are dairy intolerant, the soya milks out there. There are different types of milk out there that you can use apart from the dairies. So dairy is for those who can have it. But if you are dairy intolerant, please don't go. Just use all other alternatives I have mentioned. Okay, we've spent a considerable amount of time on the subject of menopause. I want us to get into the next one. So the last question I want us to deal with is um, someone says, I'm 43 and tend to have pins and needles and sometimes pains at night. Is, has this got anything to do with menopause? Okay, so as I explain the pre-menopausal symptoms, my first question to this person is the person losing her regular menstrual cycles, okay? Because that would be the first indication that you are going through premenopausal cell syndrome. And then you can link it with the symptoms that come alongside. So if this person is having a regular semences mm. and is having pains and senators, then it's very likely it's not semenopause. But if the person is having inconsistent menstrual cycles, and have been having this associated symptoms, mm. then maybe it could be linked. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So before I will go to the next one, I will say that the men should observe and note that the estrogen that helps in the development of the female body, the one that we got attracted to, to like and enjoy our say, women, is the same estrogen that when it gets depleted, we see that they'll be going through the same symptoms. So what we have enjoyed before, when it comes to the level that we have to really play a part in helping, we should always do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. In addition to the pins and needles, there are so many causes of pins and needles that you can have. Yes, menopause may be a factor, but there may be any other other lying conditions. So the best thing is get them to rule out all other things that can cause pins and needles then they will say, oh, now, it's nothing else but it's menopause. Because pins and needles are caused by so many factors. So I don't want you to link it to menopause. Maybe there's something sinister happening. And maybe that is the first trigger point for you to know that something is happening. But you may be thinking, because my menses is irregular, I'm in the 47, I'm this. You may be linked, but there may be something underneath. Get them checked out, rule out, and then let's say there's nothing in there, and then you can say it's menopause. Okay. Yeah. It is always important to seek advice. And that is the reason why we are doing this. We are just about to um, introduce our speaker for breast cancer. Keep the questions coming in. Keep them clear. And um, I want you to tune in. If you are on platforms, 
social media platforms, which are the popular ones are on um, WhatsApp and all that. Why don't you copy and share the link so that um, your friends and family can tune in? You, you already know the benefits of the questions that are being asked, and we want you to ask the questions. Um, we are going to move on to the next subject. But before we do that, I want to remind you of the fact that because of the virus, the coronavirus um, pandemic, um, we are not having services as we regularly have. But tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, there will be a broadcast. The focus is still going to be on our ladies, our mothers, our sisters, our female friends. We're going to honor them. They work so hard for us. And it's one day in a year that we set aside to say thank you to them. You are going to hear stories. I have handpicked three families. In some cases, um, two generations. And, 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 and if all of them are going to be here, in some cases, there's going to be three generations. A mother, a daughter, and a granddaughter. And I'm going to just have a conversation with them. My topic is the legacy of faith. How we came to faith as daughters or as um, mothers and granddaughters. How we came to faith and what we can do to pass on the baton. That is going to be the broadcast, the title for my message tomorrow morning. It will be aired at 9 a.m. and repeated at 11 a.m. And so we're going to go to our next topic. Keep your questions coming in. Um, um, stay, stay tuned and share the link with your friends and family so they will also be blessed and be educated. As I said earlier on, it's better to put a fence at the top of the hill than to put an ambulance at the bottom of the hill. Shall we welcome Sister Ivy as she brings her talk and seminar on breast cancer? Thank you so much, my dear. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ivy. My name is Ivy. I'm one of the Nightingale Nurses members. Today, we are coming to learn something about breast cancer. So first, I want us to look at the human cell, because cancer is about the cells. So when we look at this cell, the cell is our, I'll say when you are building a, a house, it's like your blocks, the blocks you use to lay your house. This is what the cell is about. And this cell that you see, provides you with nutrients, food to your hair, your body, your feet. It is the same cell that will take waste product and bring it out of your body. So this cell is very important. And it is this cell that is working to keep us alive, keep us talking, going up and down. And it has to work in its normal way. So when it is working well, there is nothing wrong with it. But when it's not working well, that is when we begin to think about cancer and other diseases. But what I want us to look at is we only have one cell, but this has, has, cell has to multiply to become a bone, to become a breast, to become a leg, to become a nose. So when we look at that, we will look at this division. So we only have one cell, as you can see up there. But you can see that as with time, it divides and becomes two. So one will become two, two will become four, Four will become eight, and it, it will divide to the point it will be developed into a tissue. And these tissues, we have so many in our bodies. And that's why you can see we have your connective tissues, we have the skeletal muscle, the nerve tissue, epithelia, and the smooth muscles. These cells divorce into these tissues so that it will develop into organs that we have, like the kidneys, the stomach, the heart, the muscles, and the breast. Because these are the tissues that we'll be talking about when we are talking about cancer. So we have different types of tissues in the body that help us to go. Just like how you have different clothes for different occasions, you have different dresses for different places, you wear different shoes, different handbags at any time, the body is like that. It has different tissues for every purpose. So when we talk about cancer, what is cancer? Cancer in the general terms means that your cells have, have grown abnormally. They've grown out of control. What if it's supposed to be a nose, it's grown out of control. So if it's supposed to be round, it may become rectangle, it may become square. Sometimes you can't even know the shape of it. So cancer means that cell you saw at the initial slide 
has changed its shape. It has multiplied. It has overgrown. Maybe if it's supposed to be 10, it is 8 or it is reduced, but the shapes has changed. So I'm going to show you something about the cell. So when you can look up there, the blue cells are the normal cells. On the normal equation, this is how your cell should look like. The blue, nice, round, divided, well. But when you look down on, below the blue, you can see the red slice. The red ones are the cancer cells. You can see the difference between the two. When you have cancer, this is how it develops. Instead of being nice and round, these are some of the shapes that you, you will have as in cancer. So when we talk about breast cancer, we are saying that the tissues in your breast, the soft tissues, the smooth muscles, the fat tissues in your cells have grown abnormally. They've had abnormal changes. They are not doing functioning as they used to function because they have changed in shape, size, and function. Something has gone wrong that they have begun to multiply or change in shape that we don't know. So that's why when we say breast cancer, that means the cancer is located just in your breast. It's only confined to your breast. It's, uh, it's affecting your breast and other parts. So it's only in the breast at the moment that we are talking about. So that is what cancer is about, breast cancer is about. And when we look at some statistics, we have about 52,000 women every year being diagnosed with breast cancer. And breast cancer accounts for 15% of all cancers in the UK. So all the different types of cancer we have, breast cancer accounts for 50. And it's seen in mostly over 50. Why do we say over, why are they saying? Because this is the time that, as you heard with the earlier lecture, the estrogen levels have dropped down. And therefore, the estrogen levels reduces. It's common in men than women. And in the UK, one in seven women are likely to develop breast cancer. For the incidence between the races, it says the, the Caucasians are slightly higher than the blacks, but it's just about the same incidence of the, the breast cancer in both races. It's just a little difference. But when you look at the death rates, we have higher death rates. The black have the higher death rates. Because according to research, it says our type of cancer, when it recurs, is a, it's a more aggressive form. So the black minority have more deaths in cancer than the whites. In the UK as well, you have 52,000 cases. 11,000 people will die out of that. Our survival rate is 878. When we say survival rate, that doesn't mean that. When we say you survive between one to five years, that does not mean that within five years you die. We are looking at the average people who have lived within those years. So some people may live up to five years, some may live up to 10 years, some may live up to 20, depending on when your cancer was diagnosed. So that will give you your rate of survival. But on the average, survival is 78%. And how much are we doing on prevention? 27%. And that is why and I think we've taken it out of ourselves to try to promote this awareness so you become aware of what is happening. So we, have some, we don't know the cost of breast cancer. Cancer in general, there is no known cause. Nobody has been to pinpoint that it is this or that, has, that causes cancer. But there are some factors that if you, are, if you have, it makes you predisposed. It increases your probability. It increases your likelihood of developing breast cancer. And those ones I have, div I have divided into two. Those that you can control, those that you, you can't control, and those that you can control. So those that we can control as human beings, we have no control over. The first one is your genetics. When we talk about genes, we are talking about the, the, genetic, the element in your cells that encodes your DNA. That makes you resemble your father, your mother, or take hereditary genes from your, 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 your generations. And those run in families. And that is why if you have somebody with breast cancer in your family, prostate cancer in your family, there's an amount of cancer in your family, you are likely to get breast cancer. Your ethnicity, as I said, although it's about the same, the death rates are a bit high. In, uh, as you age, you age, as we were saying, and when you are aging, your estrogen levels will reduce. There are other comorbidities that will affect you, your lifestyle changes. So as you age, those you are also having a risk. Age is one of the risk factors. You can never change in life. All of us are going to age one day. I can't change that I'm an, uh, an African. 
I can go, I can use all the promise on this world, but I'm still a black. You can never change your ethnicity. When you x-rays and x-rays and radiotherapy, when you need it for ex examination, you can't avoid it because they need to diagnose you. So when you have those, it's not that when you have one, please let me emphasize the x-ray and radiotherapy. That doesn't mean if you want have one x-ray, you are going to get cancer. You have, you, you, when you have a series of them, it increases your probability. For example, you have been having continuous X-ray, MRI, you already have a family history of breast CA, you have other factors. So the, all these factors combining increase your probability. So if you have four and I have one, remember you are getting dead than me because I'm still far away. If out of what I've listed, if I have one and you have four, remember you are on the way than I because you are ahead of me. When your breast tissue, some of us, our breast tissue are soft and not very thick and dense. But when you have a breast tissue that is dense, you have a risk factor of getting breast cancer. When you have had a tumor before, a, a, a benign tissue, a disease of the breast before, you also are likely. So these are all things that add, like you are adding money on top of money to buy something. The more you have, the more you're likely to buy what you want. But if you, the less you have, you can't afford it. So that is how it works. Age of puberty. The earlier you start puberty, the better for you. Then you, are, you have less. But if you start puberty late and your menopause too is late, all those are count. So all menopause and puberty affect the, because your estrogen level determines uh, when they are low. It also determines your cancer levels. Hormones, as I said, estrogen, progesterone, luteinizing, all these hormones affect you. So as you age and these are deranged for whatever reasons, you, you are likely to get a, a, a cancer. Previous cancer, your height, and not giving birth. When you give birth, according to pregnancy reduces your rate of getting cancer because it changes your body systems, hormones, because you are no more, the ovaries are no longer going to secrete, uh, how do you call it, estrogens till you give birth. So that period gives you a bit of a change in your body systems and it, it also, so if you don't give birth early and you wait and give birth late, it also increases your, uh, your, your, your probability, your diet, the fatty foods you eat, the alcohols you drink, the caffeines, the fast foods we eat, everything that we eat in life, your diet also have a probability. Smoking also affects you. We those who work night shifts, sleep, deprivation of sleep, as we heard in the earlier speaker, affects you and it also gives you a probability. So all these factors are same things that we can and we can. Obesity, if you are overweight, because you need more hormones in your body, and the more the hormones are in the body, the more they have effect on the cells in your body, you are likely to. I've talked about the alcohol pill. Then you have contraceptive pill. If you use contraceptive pills as well, you are likely to have it, as well as hormone therapy. You are also likely to have it. And if you are not exercising, you are always sitting in front of your TV. You are always not doing any exercise. You're just walking up and down, doing nothing for yourself, relaxing nicely. It, it, it affects you. It gives you your probability of having breast cancer. So let's look at the signs of breast cancer. These are signs. These are things you have to look out for when you have breast cancer. The first one is lump. When you feel your breast, that there's a lump in your breast. We'll do breast examination later if we have time. The first thing is to look out for lump. If there's a lump in your breast, it's an alarm. That doesn't mean you've got it. It doesn't mean that any lump in your breast is breast cancer. But the moment you find a lump in your breast, you need to be aware of that. When your nipple is pulled in, your nipple, it should always be out. But if it's inverted in, it's a problem. Every day you have a nice round nipple out. Then all of a sudden you begin to re realize that, ah, my nipple is gradually inverting in. You should, it should alert you. If there is dripping, you have discharge from your nipple. Redness around it and swelling around it. If your skin around your breast is changing, for some time you begin to realize that the skin around your breast is changing. This is not my usual skin, it's changing. You have to be aware that you should look for that. And when there is dimple, it's sometimes on your breast, you just find a bit of a dip in your breast and you haven't seen that before, it's something new. All these things I'm listing here, there are signs. It may not or may not be, but the best thing is when you see it, seek help as soon as possible as you see it.
So how do we diagnose breast cancer? First, the best thing for you to diagnose, or to help us diagnose, is for your breast examination. What you see and what you report will be the first step for us to begin to think of how to diagnose you. So self-examination and breast examination is vital in the diagnosis of breast cancer. And that's why they have screening. That's why they are doing screening. Every, most of the women between 41 and 70 years, every, they, they are sent letters to have mammograms done by your GPs for screening every three years. You can have best ultrasound done depending on your signs, signs and symptoms present. Depending on the condition you present, your GP may ask you to do an ultrasound. Your GP may do biopsy. There are different types of biopsy. They can do needle biopsy. They can do punch biopsy and they can do vacuum biopsy. All are just, they just want to take part of the tissue and send it for testing and know whether actually that lump or that discharge or that inverted nipple or that redness, it is cancer. So they'll go and test for it. And they can do MRI as well to help with the diagnosis. So let's see. When they have taken those tissues, they've taken your history, the GP has seen you, he's put everything together, and maybe he just to say, oh, Mr. and Mrs. So, so and so, you've got breast cancer. How do they? They have four stages of breast cancer. So the first stage is zero. As for zero means, we all want to be on the zero platform. Who wants to be out of the zero platform? For me, I want to be on the zero platform because that's why I want every woman listening to me, every man listening to me, help your woman to be on the zero platform. You, as you play with the breast day and night, you can also pick up those signs and symptoms. So when you pick up, you can say, oh, darling, ah, today your breast feels hard. Today I can see this discharge. Today I've noticed this. It's not for the women alone. Please, men, help us. Just how we help us to examine your prostate. Help us to examine our breast as well whilst you are playing. So the first stage is that your breast, the cancer is just contained in the breast tissue. It's not gone anywhere. It's in the breast tissue. So yeah, that is the first stage that is say is stage one. Stage two means it's still in the breast tissue, but some of your nose may or may not be affected. Stage three is that it is present, but it is spread to the nose around your chest wall. Around your chest wall. So stage three. So when we look at these nodes here, if the round, round little dots you see in these pictures are the nodes, they are the points where the filter, it's like a filter point, where you have to filter through your blood and your, the waste product filter through them back into your system to be discarded or to be absorbed. So they are the filter points. Normally, you shouldn't fill them with these points. You shouldn't fill this round, round dot you are seeing. So the moment you are doing a breast examination, you begin to fill these points. It should alert you that something is not right. So these are what... The points I will do it with when you are doing a breast examination. So you need. So when you are in stage three, that means some of these nodes here has been affected. Stage four means that it has spread to your body, other parts of your body, the liver, the bone, the heart, the lung. It has spread. That means it spread to the body. So these are some of the tests I mentioned. They can do a leaf ultrasound, MRI, CT scan, bone scan, liver scan. The liver scan is just to see whether it has spread to other sides of the body. So treatments. There are different types of treatments they have. First, they can do the surgery, one by removing the lump. If they find the lump, they will take it off, and that is it. Second, they can do a mastectomy. That means they are taking either one or both breasts out, depending on it. Third, they can do a lumpectomy and a mastectomy. That is, they are removing the lumps and the breast tissue together. They can also, after they've taken your breast off, God forbid, they can give you a new breast, breast which they call reconstruction. They can, they can replace it with an artificial breast so that they reconstruct with the use of your own skin. And they can also just do limbs remover. When they see that these nodes are affected, they can go in and just remove the nose. This round nose, they can just remove those nose simply, and then they can, it can be taken down. On the other hand, too, they can give you radiotherapy. That is by using radiation. And they can give you chemotherapy. That is by drugs. So that they give you chemical drugs to take. So they'll give you drugs to take, but it will be monitored. And they can give you some hormone therapy to help with, with the cancer. So let's look at a few slides. So this is your lumpectomy. The lump is up there. They've incised it, and they'll take it out. This is your mastectomy. 
They've taken the breast off, it's nicely healed, and is awaiting reconstruction. So this is how they do your breast reconstruction. They will, they will replace it, they will take tissues, either from your bottom, your hip, your abdomen, to help to reconstruct the breast for you. So some of these, all these treatments you are having, there is nothing in life that doesn't have a side. When God created us, he created our own body. So anything that you put from outside, that's likely to have an effect on the body, either positive or negative. The positive part is the disease is being controlled or is being treated, and that is how you're happy. But the negative side is it has some effects on your body. It will cause something lymphedema because the nodes in your armpit or on that side has been removed. The drainage is not going to work well. Just like how you have a blocked sink and it's not draining and the water collects in your sink. It's going to block and therefore the affected arm, you see that may be swollen because the drainage system is not working. The drainage is not just flowing to, get, to take it in and out. So that's the part of the arm will be flowing. So we call it lymphedema. There's reduction in sex drive. The sex drive is because they've used chemicals, they've used hydration, so it will reduce your libido, and therefore you're not able to go on the road. The motorway is a problem. When you use contra <laughs> contraception, you have problems with getting pregnant as well. And if you are pregnant during uh, uh, your treatment, you are likely or likely to affect it. You may not have it. It may affect the unborn child. So this, these are some of the effects of the medication. It can induce early menopause. If you have ca ca uh, breast cancer and they are treating you and you have all these drugs, it can induce an early menopause. So those are some of the effects of it. And lifestyle changes. Imagine I have two breasts. Even having two breasts, I'm not getting a man to say, Ivy, I love you. And now that I've lost the breast, who is going to come and say, I love you? It's a problem. Imagine I have my nice hair that I've put on. And because of drugs, I have to put sakura, like a calabash. Which man is coming to say, Ivy, I love you, that round head of yours? So it affects your lifestyle. You are able to work. You go to work and come. But excuse me, because of the cancer, you are bedridden. You can't go to work. You've lost social contact. Lifestyle will change. So all this thing affects your lifestyle. And therefore, you either you become miserable, you'll be happy if you have support and everything out there, you, 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 you have a problem. Your diet too will change. If you're somebody who likes eating fast food, they will tell you to change your diet. So all those things will affect your lifestyle. That's what I'm saying. You have a low sex drive. You have married a young man who is on the edge. And you are telling me I have a low sex drive. Your, family, your, your marriage is on, uh, 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 on the line. So all this are going to affect your lifestyle. So we don't want it. That's why I want every woman on this platform hearing me out there to be on the zero platform with me so that we will all be able to fight breast cancer. The men should also help us to fight it. So what can we do to prevent breast? So first thing is to be physically active. The more you become active, the more the body is working. Aspirin and anti-inflammatory drugs. These drugs help to reduce, to, to reduce the uh, hard you call it, your breaks, but don't take them unless you are prescribed them. Don't go to the shop and buy them. Don't say, Ivy said you can buy them. No, research has shown it proves, but it has to be officially prescribed. Your doctors have to say you can take it because each drug, aspirin, brufin, diclofenac, naproxen, all these drugs, have effects on the body. And therefore, you can't just walk into the shop and take them without prescription. Although they are good, they may not be even good for everybody. So please don't walk and take them. You need to be prescribed. Breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is very good. That's why we advise your, uh, the women to breastfeed for 18 months. Exclusive. Because it helps with your breast develop the breast tissue. It reduces all those uh, dense tissue in your body. You have prophylactic for high-risk women. Those who are very high-risk that they have, like they've got the gene that they call the BRCA2 gene. If they have tested you and you have those days and you have other factors and they consider you very high rates, there are special medications they will give you, including a family history, that the doctors will prescribe for you to help you reduce the, the risk of getting cancer. Lifestyle change. As well, eat well. Keep a healthy weight. Smoking has come again, oh, this smoking. It has come here again, so please those who can, if you can, at least there are other methods you can use. Stick to sensible drinking. Don't drink too much. 
especially when you are being diagnosed that you have cancer or you, are, you have those symptoms and you are contemplating, please reduce the amount of, if you can stop by reduce it and then you to reduce your risks, get help and support, seek help early. Don't wait till it's gone out of hand. When you see things, my, my, my father is old, we will always say, ignorance is not an excuse. If you don't know, you ask. If you see, you know your body than I do. You know the body that your husband do. If you see any changes, don't feel shy to ask. Because when you keep it in, by the time you voice it out, it will be too late to help you. So the earlier you see and you voice it out, the earlier somebody can help you. In, uh, in Ghana, there's a, a, a proverb that says that when you sell your, your sickness, there's a chance of you getting a, a cure for it. But the only issue with that is you have to know where you sell your sickness because some sickness are confidential. Yeah. So diet. What to eat? You need to eat less fatty foods. Less fatty foods. Don't go for the fat. I don't want to recommend. I don't know where you are and I don't know what oils you have out there. But look at the contents and look at the fat. If they are fatty foods, please don't use them. Reduce your sugars. Sugars are not good for you and your carbohydrates. Eat more of fruits and vegetables. Uh, your sugars create acidic environments. And that is, we want something that can give you more of less acidic environment. And that is helpful for you. You eat more of your fiber diets. More fruits, carotenoids, sweet potatoes, kale, tomatoes, onions, broccoli, celery, chamomile. Reduction in coffee. Especially those who have passed the menopause and then the postmenopausal stages. Reduction in coffee is very good for you. So these are some of the lifestyle changes you have. As I've put these pictures on the screen, you can see the different types. That, and the one most important thing, we need antioxidants. And that is good to fight cancer. So we have beetroots, we have pecans, broccoli, all the berries. We have kale, beans, spinach, blueberry, turmeric. In the, uh, in, the, how do, in the herb size, we have cinnamon, clove, turmeric, cocoa, cumin, basil, thyme, ginger, as much as you have there. So we have the natural herbs and the fruits out there that we can use to help us reduce our risks. Yes, the risks may be there, but if you're able to put things in place, you won't have so many risks that will accumulate and make you more likely to develop breast cancer later. So in summary, Breast cancer, what I want you to help me to reduce breast cancer is keep checking your weight, keep a healthy weight with your food intake and everything, exercise regularly, get enough rest, limit your alcohol drinking, keep on breastfeeding, and in all things, please, please do breast examination once a week. Examine your breast once a week, and that is the only way you can pick up. If you can, get your husband to be your second eye, so that they were able to pick signs that you can see. So for now, I'd like to end here, and if you have any questions for us, we will take it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for that comprehensive. I know that we are um, challenged by the constraints of time. If there was more time, I'm sure you would have um, expanded I am on this, but the question, the first question I want to throw in is, um, you mentioned sleep deprivation contributing to, um, contributing to breast cancer. I guess it might not just be breast cancer, but other forms of cancer as well. So if my job or by nature, <laughs> let, me, let me use myself as an example. When I hit 40, my sleep, the, the number of hours I sleep reduced. So for someone like me, do I need to depend on medication to help me sleep or what? Because depend on medication can also have its own side effects. So help me here, please. So thank you very much. So... I think the sleep deprivation that Sister Ivy was talking about is purely about our biological clock sleep. So um, there is a good evidence that shows that people that do um, night shifts are more predisposed to um, some cancerous cells cell developing, um, not specifically breast cells cancer. So a lot of people who does night, night shift are more prone. So I think it's to do with our biological clock sleep where we turn our social animals to sleep in the evening 
and then we wake up during the day times. And I think um, when it gets switched the opposite way, it does produce some hormones that maybe the cancerous cells may be thriving on and does express itself. Yeah. Please look on the, on the questions and if so you can. We have um, two questions. Um, one is relating, Maybe. well, I'll relate to Would the you first bring this one. Mic here? The first one first comes from um, Sylvia and she asks, um, well, she asked for a further clarification and explanation. So she said, You mentioned about height being a factor. Can you explain? This one. Uh, okay, so I think what Sister Ivy was trying to explain is your BMI, which is the body mass index. So basically, uh, we have a way that we calculate BMI to indicate if someone is so normal, someone is um, within range, and someone is obese. Uh, what we tend to see is people who are that obese or who are more than the weight that they should be, they are more prone to the um, cancerous cells expressing. Um, in most of the ethnic minorities, as she said, we've got um, a gene called Bika 1 and 2. Yeah, that expresses when you are a little bit bigger. But it's not all the bigness that comes with that. It depends on your BMI. And we calculate the BMI by looking at your weight and then your height. So you can have someone who is big, but has got a good height. It doesn't mean that the person is obese, okay? And you can have someone who is short than like, like I am, and big, and uh, you might fall in the obese area, or the overweight area. So there is a link between overweight and expressing of some circancerous genetic cells, which is quite peculiar to blacks and ethnic minorities, and that is what she was trying to say. Thank you. you want to add anything? Yeah. And, um, yeah. Okay, we got a question from Nana online. What is the difference between a benign and a malignant cell, I believe that is? Okay. So benign is the early stage of the cancerous cell, and most be benign um, development as, are not cancerous. It's like um, we have cells, and when the cells multiply, then it should do, we say that you've got a benign. So most of the benign are quite cellulized, okay? The cells have been expressed in such a manner that it's still cellulized. Then the malignant is when the cells expresses and then it moves from one area to the other. So you can have a benign, which is just the early stage, which is not spreading and it's cell localized, and most sebenai enlargement are not cancerous. So the cancerous are the cells that is gone out of the control, expresses big, and it's got the ability to move to other areas to cause more harm. So that is the benign. So if you go and say you got a benign enlargement, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a cancerous. It means that the cells have expressed more than they should be, and it's still in a contained, defined area. And something could be done about it quite easily. And in addition, benign means, it's not every benign uh, growth that becomes cancer. Some benign means it's just a lump there. It's something that has just grown out of order but it may not be even significant. If it's taken out, it may be fine. And regarding to your height, it is said that those who are a bit taller than we do have a, like, a higher risk of the average. When I say tall, higher than me, the average height. Some people are taller than the average height. Those who are taller than that have a higher risk of, uh, some risk of developing breast cancer. And uh, I think one of the peculiar questions that normally comes out is, um, why is it that black and ethnic minorities are more so likely to suffer from some cancers than our Caucasian counterparts? As I was saying earlier, um, there is a gene which is called Bika genes. They have been identified with this. So they are with a lot of ethnic minorities. And uh, when we go through stressful stages and those genes are being expressed, 
yeah, we give the genes fuel to express, then it becomes circumstantial, and it affects the women by expressing their breast circumstances, and it does also affect men by, by expressing it in our prostate. So that gene in particular, which are the bigger genes, are what we've got as ethnic minorities, and when we are doing something or we go through various stresses, we, um, the genes expresses itself by showing up more in, uh, in, uh, in its uh, nature, and it end up in causing the circumstances. So you can see that most black and ethnic minorities, when you put by comparing our cancerous rate uh, with our Caucasian counterparts, you always see that we are on the leading end than our Caucasian counterpart. That's why normally we hear that uh, most black and ethnic minorities have more breast cancer, we have more prostate cancer, is because of those genes that are peculiar to black people. We have a question from Akoswa. So she's asking about the best methods or ways of checking your breasts. Okay, Akoswa, I will leave, yeah, I will, I will leave Sister Ivy um, or if any of our colleagues here would be happy to come and do a little bit of breast examination. I think it's the time. It is time. Yeah. There's different ways of examining the breast. But I have that on a different slide I had wanted by time constraint. You have different one you have to look in the mirror. First, you stand in your mirror. When you stand in the mirror, you'll be able to see your breast. So you need to you need to stand in the mirror and oh. just inspect. First, we call it inspect. Just look at your we breasts and see whether they are normal. Yes. Both are the Would same. Like Any discharges, anything that you see abnormal, you, 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 you will notice it. Second, you raise up your hand up. You look up. You look up. You raise in the mirror. You are able to see whether there are any changes as well. You are looking for the same signs of uh -huh, yes. you are looking for these signs as you examine your breast so when i raise up my hand i'm expecting to see that i can't see any of the these signs i'm looking at so i'm i'm looking for this as i lift up my hands and on the other hand you can lie, no, you lie down as well but when you lie down you need to put one hand behind your back and with the the, the flat side of your fingers, you are going to use it round. On, uh, imagine I'm lying on my back with my hand at my back. I'm going to use, because there are lumps, those little lumps I showed you up here. This one. Okay. These are not supposed to be felt. So these lumps, these small, small balls you've seen around the breast wall, is not supposed to be felt. So these are what I'm going to examine for and I see for any hardness in the breast tissue as well. So when I put my left hand behind, I'm using this flat side of my finger. I'm going to go in a rotating move. I start from the side of the chest wall. I'm going around. I'm trying to feel if I can feel any lump or any hard tissue. So I'm going to go round, round, round. I'm going to go all through the breast. And you are pressing it a little bit against the chest wall. So when I finish, I'm going to do the same thing to the right. The same way you examine the left, the same way you examine it. You can also be under the shower. Go, people feel it's easier because it's under the shower. You can go in the shower. You have mirrors in your shower room. You can also do the same, and you can see that it's, you will be able to feel it. If you don't feel anything in your breast, you are fine. If you don't see any changes or those signs and symptoms you've seen in the breast, I've shown you, then you are fine. But if you pick one out of them, that doesn't mean you have it. It means that there's an alert, go and have your breast checked. For breast, it takes a time. I would have loved to have it on the floor, do it and have, for you to have a look, but we don't have time. And also with the men, the men can also be natural observers where they observe where the nipples are. So if you know that your wife, always the nipple is facing maybe 68 degree, or maybe it's a 98 degree, the nipple is always facing you. And you see that on one morning, one of the nipple is facing southwest, it should be an alarm. Okay? So the men can also observe. And it's not that you only touch by touching to enjoy. You touch, and if you see any difference, you can alert your spouse as well. That it looks like there is a lump here. Yeah. So the nipple is also one area that you can 
No, because if you have a lamp occurring in any part of the breast, the, the, the easiest way to find it by just having a look is to look at the position of the nipple. So if the lamp is here, obviously the nipple is going to go in. Okay, and then and and the nipple might not be the same place as it used to be, based on where the lamp is set developing. So nipple observation, I would say that the men should keep an eye on. We have, sorry, we have one more question. Um, it's it's related to menopause, and it comes from Rose. So she wants to know: Is it possible that a woman can miss menopause? Is it possible for a woman to miss menopause? They get to their 50s, there's no symptoms or signs of um, menopause. Yeah, people that... do have delayed menopause. It's not everywhere. What we are saying that from 40, 70, 51, it's an average statistic for February. There's always the odds yeah. out of it. Well, the, the, the there's always the, the odds. The difference is you, you are mentioning delayed menopause. Yes. This person is asking, you is can it, po miss. Is you it can possible miss. for a woman? I haven't, heard, I haven't researched into race. So I can't. If you say to miss a menopause, does it mean that they will miss the symptoms or they will not go through I the menopause at all? I think she's referring to like she won't go through yeah. menopause. Yes, won't go through. So if, for instance, the person is 80 years, will be menstruating till 80 years. Is that the question? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, because mm -hmm. the question might be interpreted in two ways. Yeah, so so, it could be, I think it could be just missing as in they don't have any clear have symptoms, any symptoms of it other oh. than yeah. just... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, there are people that do not experience much symptoms. They experience some transient uh, symptoms that they, they might not even take note of. Mm. Yeah. So it's possible, Elida, that someone will only see that their menstrual cycle is being distorted and eventually will get distort eventually without them necessarily experiencing the severe symptoms that we de describe about. So if that is what the question is, yes, then it's possible that some people will be having some transit symptoms that they might not necessarily experience it. Some will experience slight symptoms but engaging in few activity will suppress the symptoms, and some do have very, very, very severe symptoms, mm. and that is what we have just described about. If the question is supposed to mean, are there people that never lose or, ne ne well, are there people that could continue menstruating till 80 years? There might be. There might be people that could do that for a longer years, but the science tells us that as you aging, your oestrogen cell levels will come low and your X, the amount of X in you will also be depleted. So it makes a natural sense that eventually you might get to a stage that you won't experience menstrual cycles anymore. The, for the question of missing to is that because these symptoms are universal symptoms, you may be experiencing it, but it can be related to anything. So you may be thinking, oh, maybe it's my diabetes, it's my hypertension, it's my this. Because you are not relating, these symptoms we have mentioned is not specific to menopause. You can have it in any other diseases. So you may be thinking, because it's related to my diabetes or it's related to my hypertension, you are not relating to menopause, so because your mind is not there. So... It, it may not be because you haven't picked it and related it, but you, have, you may have experienced it in relation to other conditions. So you may have skipped it that, oh, maybe it's because of my diabetes, I'm having pins and needles, or because of this. So some may have lost that track because of other comorbidities they have. So it may be possible to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question that we have is, is it advisable to wear wired brows? Wired? Or underwired, yes, wired. Um, that, that's that. I, I think the implication, or, or what they might be asking, would that inc increase the, 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 the yeah? For that, I can't say yes or no because I haven't actually done There's any no research into it. Yeah. So I don't okay. want to say yes or no. But all I want to say maybe is the heat. Yes, I haven't researched into that, so I don't yeah. want to give you any false information. That's fine. Yeah. I think I can add just something uh, small to this. Uh, the wide bra. Um, if you feel pain when you have a wide bra, make sure that you go to the shop to be measured. 
because a lot of rumors comes out that the why causes cancer, why causes that, which I haven't seen any evidence yet. But what, uh, I mean, from my own experiences, if you have a bra, you know, some of us have got small breasts, some of us have got big breasts. It needs to be measured. If you have a wrong size, there is a possibility that the bra will keep on pressing on your bra, uh, if it's small, your breast. If it's Sorry, small, yeah. if, if, if it's a small, if, it, if it's a, a big breast and you have a small uh, wide under, it keeps on pressing and pushing it. So you feel something, you know, it's very painful. Go and get your, uh, uh, your breast measured and get a proper size on. Um, is it true that men feeding on the breast can reduce the probability of the disease? For that, I can relate. Is there any research? Yeah. Okay. Feeding on the breast as, as breast milk? As, as or? Part, no, as part of romantic um, expression. Yeah, intimacy. I, okay. Is it, so it, 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 what we know is, I spoke about um, the genes, mm -hmm. Baker one, B, Baker two, and all the Baker genes. There are some hormones that, if you release it, it suppresses the expression of those genes. And some of the hormones are love hormones, like oxytocin. Yeah, they try to suppress the expression of those genes. So when you're making love and you're touching breasts, you're kissing breasts, it releases those hormones that suppresses the release or the, it suppresses the activation of these genes that expresses as cancerous genes. Mm -hmm. So you may link to the fact that if you expresses in an act, if you engage in an act, which is more love act, okay, because it continues to release the love hormones, mm -hmm which suppresses the gene from expressing, you are so likely not to suffer breast cancer as a result of that. Yeah. However, if you suck a breast in such a manner or you touch a breast in a rough way, in such a manner that increases irritation, then it's going to prone more that. I, I think the question is more to do with the romantic side more yes, than the abusive yes. side. Yes, it's true. It's not only the breast attaching or the breast kissing, but anything that releases love hormone. Yeah, so it could be holding of hands, it could be watching a TV with your family, it could be anything that is enjoyable that will be releasing less stressful hormone, but a productive hormone, which is love hormone, that we have just talked about, to suppress the kind of genes that expresses as circumstances genes. Okay, so if a woman is afraid of getting breast cancer, they shouldn't say, hey, love, just keep, um, keep on with this one. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> that is the reason why we bring um, clarity in this. So yeah. excessive um, stimulation of that part for romantic purposes isn't going to get rid of it. Because, no, okay, no, no, no. It. It's the hormones that might be linked, yeah. Okay. And you could do a lot of things mm -hmm. to release good hormones that will suppress sure. it. One is exercise. Yeah. Good is e e eating is a good food. Yeah. Three is sleeping very well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Four is um, avoiding stress at work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whilst you're on this, if a woman has history of breast cancer in their family, would you advise for the removal of the um, breast before it gets to them? No, no. Yeah. So when you have breast cancer, you see in in the family history. Uh huh. W will you advise? Would you advise the, the removal of the breast? No, no. Anyone that will have mastectomy, mm. which is the removal of the breast, either a partial or a total, should be having some cancerous cells expressing in it. Okay, so that is purely a surgical decision. So you go to the oncology department, they will examine it, and they will either decide to cut a little bit of the breast out, or maybe they'll give you treatment for it. No, I'm not saying someone has got it, but no. someone who's got history. If you have their got Their grandmother history. has got it, uh, well, their no. grandmother died of it, their mother died of it, should they, no. in prevention? Yeah. No, they don't take out your breast, mm -hmm. because 
Yes, it's hereditary, but you may not get it. Okay. If you are able to control your lifestyle yeah. changes, you may or may not get it. Sure. You may have the genes, you may have it, but if it's not expressed mm. with, through your lifestyle changes, as it's stress hormones or anything, it's like you may not even, you may be out of that generation that may even never get it. Yeah. So I would advise you to take your breast and until the doctors have said, yes, IV, God forbid, mm. yes, now that you have got family history, your genes have begun to express the, these hormones and then you are therefore likely to get it and it is your choice. Do you want to take it out now or you want to wait? Yeah. So for now, I will say, I will say no, don't take it off sure. because it's, it may, you may not even get it. Although you have it, yes, in the family, mm. but you may not. Although it's a probability, mm. it adds risks, but you may not, depending on all your history, factors, and social life, they pull all together. Yeah. Thank you so much. One, one, one point that was not made, but I've come across it, was male breast cancer. Yeah? And um, that is another topic for another day, but I just want to throw that in because in my experience, I mean, it was, it was in the news anyway. There was once a conservative party leader called Michael Howard, and I understand his dad had male breast cancer. And, and that is just to alert people that there are all these things. I guess the percentage is minimal. minimal yeah. The percentage might be minimal, but it is there, and prevention is better than cure. Being aware of it can have a lot of impact. Yes, male, males think, do have... I think it's in a slide. It's, it's in a, a slide, do yeah? Have, so, yeah. Okay, so that males is... Males do have breast cancer. Yeah, okay. One, one of the slides have it, yeah. yeah. I That's fine. Yeah. But I thought so I was... Males do, but it's just a very small portion of males. Minute percentage, yes. I guess. But males, so it's not just uh, how women... All of us have breasts. Mm -hmm. and we can all do, but it's just that it's more common in, in the women in because, women because of our estrogen. In men, the estrogen levels are on the lower side, so the, but they do have it. But when the, the last time I was reading the research, it was about mm. 300 and something men mm. who have mm. the uh, breast cancer. So is there in men as well? So men is, is not exclusive to women. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is the point I wanted to make because for some, yeah. when I heard that um, Mark Howard's father mm -hmm. had um, breast. breast cancer, that, that was the first time I, in my life I, uh, that I had come across that. Okay? Yeah. So um, thank you so much for that educative um, um, seminar that we've had. Um, the, the broadcast, and I was reading a few comments there, and there's a lot of people that are commending um, what has gone on, being educative, being informative, and all that. And you know that we'll do this again. Yes. Um, <laughs> we'll we, we do this again because of what is going on now with the um, coronavirus. We need to educate our people. We need to prevent it before it spread. If it wasn't for this, this place would have been packed. Over 70 women had already registered to come for breakfast, but because of this, it couldn't happen. And so I want to say a big thank you to you for taking the time to be here. And um, if possible, uh, we might have to book a date to record um, in favor of how to prevent and manage and also to examine the breasts and more information on um, menopause as we have tackled uh, um, a few moments ago. May I say a huge thank you to, I don't know whether Chairman wants to add anything before. Yes, we uh, Pastor, we also thank um, Ellen Pentecostal Church and Pastor Secondalias for giving us this opportunity. We will follow it on the Facebook and then also on the YouTube. And if there are any further questions, we'll try as much as possible to answer there. If there are questions that we couldn't answer or we thought um, the knowledge is so beyond this. We work with a lot of consultants and we're with much people that have got um, speciality um, um, knowledge in the area that we present. We will seek information and we'll put it on the platform. So we do say thank you all. And as Pastor have said, we'll be coming back again and maybe with COVID-19 uh, to give some education on it and how we can all prevent it and the strategies that have been adopted by various governments in the world. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Well, for those that are watching, uh, there's quite a number of you still watching online. Um, on behalf of the church, I want to say a big thank you to the team that came. Um, through the information that has already gone out, you will find these numbers for your benefit. All that has gone on, all, all that has gone on will be online. The videos to do with menopause 
and breast cancer will be online. Invite your friends and family to visit and to inform themselves. Tomorrow, we are, as I mentioned in the interval, tomorrow there's going to be a broadcast focusing on um, Mother's Day. We're going to honor our women, our, uh, the mothers, the sisters, um, the aunties in our lives. And um, I want you to tune in. We will broadcast at 9 a.m. just as we would have had a service here, and that will be repeated at um, 11 a.m. Uh, if you have further questions, just as the chairman indicated, do bring them in. But tomorrow, the focus is going to be on honoring our mothers and the women in our lives. I've got three families, in some cases two, uh, two or three generations, that I'm going to have a conversation with uh, for them to express their gratitude to their mothers and also to focus on the legacy of faith, how their faith has been passed on from one generation to another. And so tune in, please, by all means, um, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. On Tuesday, we will have um, a live prayer meeting, uh, again, possibly on Facebook and YouTube, or maybe through telephone conferencing. We will update you accordingly. May the Lord be with you and bless you, protect yourself, and look after each other as we do uh, really well in this church. God bless you. Bye-bye.